Hello, good morning or good afternoon if you are in the East Coast. Uh, we appreciate you joining our uh, first broadband breakfast live online event. My name is Drew Clark. I'm the editor and publisher of broadbandbreakfast.com. And this is uh, an experiment that and I've obviously uh, repeat uh, down there. So I had to turn that off. That's uh, part of the experiment. Um, what we're doing today is starting a discussion about how broadband tools can assist in combating the coronavirus uh, and the disease COVID-19 that is obviously now a worldwide pandemic as declared by the World Health Organization. Over the next hour, you're gonna hear from some expert panelists who are familiar with the field of online education. Uh, and online training and how these kinds of tools can assist in uh, mitigating and combating the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic that we're in the midst of. Uh, but before I turn to each of our panelists uh, and give some brief introductions about them, I just wanna set the stage a little bit more about the coronavirus and broadband. Over the last two weeks, of course, I, with millions of Americans and I'm sure billions of, of uh, 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 humans, uh, uh, people on earth, have uh, striven to learn as much as we can about uh, this, this disease that's uh, confronting us. And while, you know, I'm no expert, we're no experts, uh, you know, one can learn and follow uh, from history. And obviously the, uh, the influenza pandemic of 1918 has been getting a lot of attention. And I've been trying to get a little, struggling to get a little bit of context. Like what is, uh, what happened? What was the world like in the 1918 uh, flu pandemic? And, um, you know, struggling uh, to get a little context, I, I uh, found my grandfather's memoirs uh, and uh, he actually, uh, you know, it, talking with, with people in my family, I was, was wondering, well, it, what was the impact of this in people's memories? And again, this is 102 years ago, but um, I did run across this line in his biography, which I looked at just uh, last night. Uh, he lived in Southern Idaho and Utah. And he says, um, he was a teacher. He was 29 years old at the time. And he, he talked about, when I returned to Farmington, a letter awaited my arrival requesting that I return to Georgetown and complete the teaching year of a teacher who had not returned after the Christmas holidays. It was the flu year and very little school was held. The board only paid me for the day's talk. So I thought, isn't that remarkable that here we're dealing with this pandemic and schools across the country have basically gone online, canceled classes. Now K through 12 schools are doing the same. Many school districts and states have, have canceled schools and are talking about online education uh, and planning kind of while things are, are in, 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 in crisis stage to, to do this. But what is different now from the pandemic of, of 1918 is we have the internet, we have broadband technology and tools. And that's what we're trying to do here with this event and next week at the same time and the week after. Today, we're gonna to talk about broadband and education. And we've got experts assembled to, to talk about that. A week from now, we're gonna talk about telework and broadband and how people in the workplace are adapting uh, to, to, to uh, the coronavirus. And then the, the following week on the, the 20, uh, uh, 7th of, of March, we're going to talk about the digital divide and how that uh, is, is really going to be tested over the next several weeks and months and longer as we uh, as, as we see what's what's uh, the impact of this. So I, I appreciate you bearing with my story. Uh, it's my way of trying to understand the impact of this for our society. And with that, I'm going to turn now to Charles Severance. Charles, and I'm going to go ahead and pull you into the screen here, Charles, um, uh, and, and pop you up so that uh, people can see you. Uh, and I'm trying to just do a, a two screen there. Okay, uh, let's try one more time. Um, uh, so um, Charles, uh, you are a um, 
clinical associate professor of information. Uh, correct me if any of this information is wrong. And you are uh, someone who's worked quite a lot in online education. Uh, and, and you've talked a lot about uh, how it, a lot of thought needs to go into that. I've unmuted you and let's go ahead and have a, a discussion here. Uh, just lay out, lay out the landscape, uh, both online education as the field and discipline has been observed and seen, but also what's happened the last two weeks, the last month, the last two, two months as people have been trying to understand and prepare for this. What's your world like today as you're dealing with online education, Charles? Well, I, I, I've been doing online education since 1996. I was the first human being on the planet to fully video stream a class. Uh, I used 28 modems and um, been working online ever since, part of the MOOC revolution in 2012, teach the largest uh, programming class in the world. And if, if I was to sort of sum it all, all that, <laughs> what, years of uh, experience uh, online teaching, um, it comes down to the fact that real teachers find ways to use tools that are imperfect to still teach. And so every time I was faced with some new technology, whether it was uh, modems in 1996, I, after a while you couldn't send videos, so I put a little creepy picture of myself in the upper left-hand corner. It was only a picture because I couldn't reliably stream uh, video over 14.4 modems, right? And so at some point you just you just find a way to adapt, improvise, and then and then master. And so, so there's this moment where you sort of you're stuck with a set of tools that are not ideal. You find a way to teach, and then and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a sec, this is there's there's advantages, and so it goes from advantage to advantage. Uh, but it takes a long time to get to the point where you can uh, see the limitations of things like teaching online as an advantage. And I'm at the point now that I am probably more comfortable teaching 100,000 people online than I am teaching 100. Not, not that I'm uncomfortable teaching on campus, but I know exactly what I need to do to teach 100,000, but that has been a decade plus of experience. And so what I, I, I've been sort of avoiding helping my colleagues. I let my colleagues go through the transition each, each in their own way of the limitations of the new environment in which they've, in which they've got to teach. But I have a, a deep and firm belief that uh, teachers will find a way. And so I'll, I'll stop there and let others talk. But I think, you know, we need to talk about sort of coping mechanisms and and what you would do when you're like forced online for the first time and how you can best uh, adjust to that. Well, let, let me let me actually uh, ask a couple questions to pull a little bit more out, Charles. So so how long did you prepare for teaching your first MOOC, your first, you know, multi online online course? And and what what uh, advice would you have for people who have to kind of dive in it without that kind of time to prepare for it? Yeah. So. So I was lucky. I mean, I I was trying to teach to a broad audience because one of the things that you that that happens when you teach online is there are far more opportunities for the student to sort of fall off, to to lose track of what you're saying, or to not do well on an assignment and then kind of disconnect from the class. And so I was teaching starting in 2008 um, a class of people who were um, mostly female librarians was teaching uh, write code and they were easily confused because they just didn't have any natural programming ability and they really didn't want to learn it. They were forced to take this class. And so I was, I was blessed in a way to have such a challenging uh, mission in my, uh, from 2008 to 2012. But in that I figured out everything that could go wrong with how I was teaching Python. And then in 2012, 2013, when I'm tapping, I actually had figured out how to eliminate the flaws and rough edges in all my courses. And so then when I went online, it was really easy, but it was four years of um, preparation for that. And so like, as I make more MOOCs, usually it is one to three years of on-campus preparation for me to then make my MOOCs an overnight sensation. Um, if I go back to the MOOC time, like in the 2012, I would say that the most important thing that I learned and the most important thing that led to my ultimate success is as a teacher, you need to think about what is the essence of what you're teaching. What do you really have to teach? Because one of the things we do 
as teachers. I don't know if it's the curriculum committee or because we thought our college was really difficult is we, we sometimes conflate the concept of um, rigor and misery. And mm -hmm. that if it, we, we think that uh, you're, if you're teaching a class and the students are not miserable and happy, then apparently you're not teaching with enough rigor. And um, I, I know that you're sitting in curriculum committee and, and someone will throw across that your class is not rigorous enough. I mean, it's the standard thing. Like you should be able to, if you're, you can teach this much, you should be able to teach 20% more and be more rigorous because, you know, college is for tough people and, 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 and whatever. And, and I get that. I mean, we do get people on campus. We push them really hard. They learn a lot and it's a wonderful experience, but I think we have to be careful of the conflation of, of just difficulty, misery, and rigor. And, and as a teacher, you got to relax a bit and say, what do I really and truly need to teach? Because when you're online, if you don't know exactly what you're going to teach, you can get distracted in all the detail weeds that you can get away with when you got office hours and teaching assistants and so many redundancy items that you have teaching in a, in a campus situation that you just don't have online. And so figure out what the essence of what you're teaching is and okay. find ways to teach to the essence. Okay, okay, awesome. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll certainly come back to you as we, as we uh, circle around. I'm gonna turn now to, to Rob uh, Vitsky. Uh, Rob is um, uh, with Internet2 and he's actually been extremely active in this subject matter. Um, Rob, uh, as the Vice President of Network Services at Internet2, um, I wonder if you could just lend some context to the moment we're in right now. What is it that uh, people uh, need to be aware of? Uh, let's focus on universities first, okay? Uh, but but I know Internet 2 has got a, a broader purview than that. But tell us just, like, I mean, it's just been one week, right? On Monday, Columbia, I mean, maybe in Washington State, there was a little bit of, of, of this going on, but Columbia Monday, Harvard on Tuesday. I think every university that I'm aware of that I've seen has got some kind of, all right, don't come back for some long period of time. So, so what is happening from your perspective in the online university landscape right now? Yeah, th thanks, Drew, and you know, thanks for putting this together. I think this is a truly an extraordinary time um, from from our perspective, and you know, events like this are really important in starting to think about some of the issues that um, are coming to the fore. Um, I think you know Internet2 works with 43 state and regional networks that provide service to colleges and universities and K-12 and libraries. And all of those institutions right now are going through um, just a massive rethinking about um, how they provide the infrastructure for online learning. And, and you're absolutely right that at the beginning of the week, I think some of the infrastructure planners might have seen this coming, but it wasn't coalesced into policy or decision making yet. And that really changed on Wednesday. Um, and we see it in traffic patterns on the network already. We see it in um, you know, folks uh, tr scaling up the use of the video collaboration platforms in particular, um, and then just overall changes in um, our traffic patterns. We in the state and regional networks have spent 20 some odd years or longer um, tuning our infrastructure to the rhythms of the academic community on campuses and in schools. Um, and tuning, um, you know, not just for the calendar, but for the traffic patterns and um, the various applications that folks use. And what's happening now is another whole set of networks are bring, brought into that, which is the home and consumer networks. Um, and so the traffic patterns are changing, the timing's changing, and all those things, you know, we can start to see in um, some of the analytic tools we have. Um, and obviously, that's going to accelerate over the next couple of weeks as well. So, so I think... So, sorry, keep going. Didn't mean to step on your No, point. no. I mean, I think I think that, you know, uh, there are kind of two things going on. One is uh, we and a lot of state and regional networks are doing a lot of work right now to shore up um, the, the intersections between us and those commercial networks, um, which, you know, we knew the traffic pattern for a very long time. It's going to change. And so we're trying to anticipate what some of those um, changes might be. Uh, you know, you saw maybe this morning that some of the home broadband providers have removed caps um, and done some things to um, increase the bandwidth they have available in um, you know communities where they might be on a lower plan or something or removing some of that. And that, so that's all great um, and you know really shows the collaboration that's happening to try and get ready for some of this. Yeah. On the other hand, 
there's a lot of infrastructure that may need investment. Um, and that, you know, even if you do that very quickly, won't happen immediately. It's not a virtual change. It's going to take time. So, so to summarize and, and broadly generalize, uh, Rob, you're kind of dealing with the, 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 the pipes and of the way universities are going to tackle this new challenge, you know, the, the bandwidth and the, the issues with bandwidth. And Charles, you're almost more on the kind of uh, application layer, if you will, like how the, the content is molded, how it's used. So, so, so let me actually ask either of you, and then, and then we'll get Adrian in to get a little bit of perspective from the reporting she's done. Uh, t t tell me what kind of feedback you're getting, and let's start with your professor and administrator colleagues at universities. What are they saying they need? What are their 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 pain points like right now and for the next couple of weeks? Let's start, Rob and, and Charles, uh, both of you. Uh, well, I think I think one is just trying to get their arms around what scale and um, and how to get this. Some of the campuses, you know, clearly have chosen to use their spring break next week to get organized, and that's great. Um, some of them have jumped right in, and you know, it was funny. We were um, yesterday talking about some of the traffic patterns we were seeing, and you know, what it what it really meant, and we made some calls to campuses to ask what they were doing, and it. Some cases they're you know having hundreds of staff log into these applications simultaneously to stress test them, and then someone sent me a news report from Boston last night of a Columbia student who was you know they were over their shoulder watching them actually use the tools and they have made the transition, um, and so I think a lot of what we're working on this week is just you know helping people understand um, how the use of the infrastructure may change and anticipate some of the things that um, they need to prepare. Their faculty for in terms of um, you know I think again some of the assumptions that we have um, will change as we actually start really ramping up usage of these systems and they need to be prepared to kind of have a bad first day or to work through this thing over a couple of weeks it's not going to be perfect on the first day right we're having challenges of our own we we hope to and still hope to have John Bernstein join us and he's saying he can't he can't get in so hopefully we'll get you in John if you're if you're watching and, and of course this this is obviously streamed live and will be replayed and again we want to refine this but Charles what's your take on what is the need what are the pain points right now in the university context so I would say that the, the, the first issue is uh, learning to use the software and services that we already have, right? Um, you know, if you have a learning management system or a video streaming service, uh, uh, the, my colleagues are like, okay, how do I use Zoom? Um, how do I use my LMS? My first question this morning it was LMS, uh, learning this? management system. Okay. Yeah. And so... And, and so the, my first question this morning was, I, I haven't needed in my learning management system to send an email message that could get everybody's inbox within 15 minutes to say, oh, I have this pop-up meeting, right? And so I had to go learn. The software was there. It had always been there. It was just a feature that I had not used. And so I think in the first couple of weeks, we're just going to learn to better use the tools that we've been using all along. New tools are going to be hard to, uh, hard to bring online. I would, I would say that an, another uh, big issue right away, and, and my school took two days off, canceled for the rest of this week, and we're going to start online next week. And that just gave us all a bit of a time to emotionally adjust and the students to emotionally adjust. Although I had lectured this morning at 10 o'clock, and I put that lecture online, but um, I said to the students, we're going to talk about how it's going to work. I'm not going to give an actual lecture. I'm going to talk about sort of emotional needs, technical needs, and and I think an important thing is is to, to kind of be open to the student. So most of what I was doing was asking the students, how does this work? How does that work? Let's try this. You tell me. You do this. You do that. And by the way, if you have other issues, make sure you're taking care of yourself, right? And and I think we also have to, you know, get our empathy up. And so I, I, I think for, for me and my colleagues, we're we're trying to get so that our culture's right and our values are right and our attitudes are right and then the teaching will come um and so it's it's like speed little technical details on the software um getting to the point where we're talking to students first about like what the experience is like and what we can do together and being open to keeping the students in the loop and keeping input coming from the students so that we feel like we're a cohesive group of people who are 
feeling good enough about being with each other so that then learning can happen. So it's not just like, here's the stuff and I'm going to shove it down your throat and I've got a different way of shoving it down your throat. The first thing you got to do is create the bond that is the, the teacher, the teacher student bond right. that, that we, that we've had so natural. And so um, right. I, I, I think building new things and inventing new stuff, I, that's going to come. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now we, we have a new panelist. Uh, I'm going to add him into the stream. Uh, John Bernstein, uh, who is the uh, president of Bert Bernstein uh, Strategy Group. He will be able to speak to some of the issues that he's dealing with um, on a, um, uh, I, I think it's primarily K-12. I, I don't know if you're also dealing with higher education, John. Um, but I also want to make sure to get Adrienne into the picture. So uh, while um, while, while we uh, kind of um, get to you in a moment, John, let me turn to you, Adrian, to just, uh, you've been reporting this issue for two weeks or, or more, uh, but with particular emphasis on online education. And could you just talk about some of the things that you've been discovering in your reporting, in, uh, in, in reaching out to experts and to students, and, uh, you know, what's, what some of these people are, are saying as you've interacted with them? Yeah. <clears throat> so I was originally reporting on telemedicine, and then as the schools started shutting down, I moved to reporting on um, online education. And what I gathered from interviews with professors, um, also I spoke with people in the press offices at Columbia University. I spoke with um, someone at MIT. It seems like this isn't going to be Due to the circumstances, this won't be a robust online learning experience um, just because of what's going on, how reactionary it is. And um, the students seem to understand that because they know that there isn't really another option. Um, however, this isn't really how online courses are supposed to look just because it is so hasty. Um, and it seems I spoke mainly with universities. I still haven't been able to hear back from anyone in um, high school or elementary schools. Um, but it, it seems like there's this widespread assumption that students, even though they're being asked to leave the campuses, will have access to uh, broadband. And the students I spoke with do have access to high-speed internet, but it also leaves that question of what about students who are returning um, to a really rural area or areas that don't have broadband. Um, and a lot of the universities will be using Zoom, um, according to many people I spoke with. Um, I spoke with Charles yesterday as well. And it seems like Zoom is something that a lot of universities have already been using for meetings. It's something that teachers um, are familiar with and comfortable with. I spoke with a student, um, I spoke directly with his wife, um, and then she communicated with him for me. He's a English PhD student at University of Iowa, and all of his courses for the rest of the um, semester will be online, and they're heavily discussion-based seminar-style classes, and so it seems like a lot of the courses that uh, will suffer in this time are uh, labs, um, seminar classes, discussion-based courses, and he was really empathetic. He said, I'll be missing um, the conversation and what I learned from being able to interact with the other students in the classroom. However, I know that due to the circumstances, this is how it has to be. And he recognizes that um, the online courses will be difficult just because the courses weren't designed to be online, the classes that he's taking. Um, but he did say that he'll have time to explore his personal interests as well, the areas that he's really interested in in his degree. Um, and there's also been this anxiety within the universities about the international students. Um, the person I spoke with works at MIT, works in the president's office. Um, and I uh, spoke with another individual at Boston University, and there's um, this anxiety about students who don't have a way to get home, who need to still use the campus services. Um, and there's some students who have been asked to leave, and so they're trying to find people in the community who can um, right. take the, children, the kids into their homes for the time being. 
Um, let me let me so, jump in a second and and build on this and and uh, and again I want to get Rob's reaction on this point about um, the the networks right and the the bandwidth capacity and some of the issues and then I want to get Charles uh, 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 feedback on on just like okay like throw it on Zoom right I mean how how do you, how do you have at least the semblance of a of a seminar or a discussion. I mean, clearly there are some aspects of an online class. I've taken online classes and there's some things you get that you, you can't uh, replicate that are better in some ways, but but let's talk about that. And then after that, we're gonna shift over to the K-12 uh, situation and how education, online education is confronting the coronavirus. And, and finally, actually before Rob and then Charles go, I wanna ask our readers, we've been covering this at broadbandbreakfast.com. Adrian's done several stories on this. We invite you to you know, look at our, our coverage of how broadband's impacting the coronavirus at broadbandbreakfast.com. So Rob, on the bandwidth, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, well, I think there are really two things that we're, we're thinking about right now. You know, first of all, everyone is, you know, back to the kind of the people part of this and the empathy and whatever else, um, all these IT companies want to have a win here and uh, support this you know, national crisis. And so people are putting a lot of effort into it. And um, the level of communication and collaboration and expedited activity is, is great. Um, and so you need to say that. That said, you know, campuses, let's take um, video conferencing as an example, have had you know, tens of or dozens of or hundreds of um, uh, faculty and staff using some of these applications between campuses for years now. And that works really well. It's a totally different thing when you take hundreds of kids out of lecture halls across hundreds of institutions and they all start at 11 a.m. Um, the same class. And so, you know, some of the scaling issues here, both in terms of the connect interconnectivity between the providers and um, the providers themselves are going to be interesting. And I think it's another piece in addition to the, you know, how do you take the um, lesson that you've perfected in a classroom and move it online? Um, we also have the issue of how do you go not only from your campus's experience with dozens of video conference users to thousands, um, but multiply that by all the campuses. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's going to take time, I, I think, but um, some of the tools are there. For instance, you know, to the extent that you can move these applications into the large cloud providers, they have the scalability. Um, so, you know, we're going to be we're going to be, you know, doing some whack-a-mole the next month or so in terms of where the bottlenecks are. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of um, good effort trying to solve this and get ahead of it if we can. Charles, what, what's your take? Well, I'm going to build a little bit on what Rob said. Um, this is I I used it uh, once. Saw I've been this is my third meeting already today that I'm originating from my home and I get some wired internet, wired Ethernet rather than wireless. Uh, and I was really happy when we started this software that we're using here that it's going to send only 480p of my video, right? That that we don't, if we're going to scale this stuff up, maybe we're going to need things like Zoom to have a feature that says, send me at 480p, not 1080p. Because we've always had like four people in a room and everybody gets to go 1080p, but that just isn't going to work. And so I think there are going to be uh, little technical things, as Rob was saying, that we're going to have to jump on like a whack-a-mole that basically says, let's make all these video things capable of sending 4D, which I sort of alluded to that in 1997 when I moved from uh, uh, 288 modems to 14.4 modems, I had to switch from video to a picture, right? And so I think we're going to find this. I think that if we don't have video, it's going to be terrible um, because just audio is not enough for this because there's no, it's hard to get empathy through audio. So things like software that's going to need to drop down to 40p so that we have enough people and, and have all work on, you know, different home computer networks. And also, we haven't mentioned 5G yet. I'll just throw that out as it's an interesting time for 5G to be showing up in this as well. But yeah. I also want to talk something about what Drew said, and that is I'm guardedly optimistic about this. And, uh, and, and my lectures are so wonderful that the students don't ask questions. They're just, they just, they're just so just amazed by my wonderful lectures. <laughs> I believe that as I switch to this new online format, I'm going to get a lot more questions, right? I'm, I, and I'll have to change a little bit. And I think that students will participate more. Um, another thing is I'm in a phase of my class where projects are starting to happen. And my brain is like, should I cancel the projects? And I'm like, no, no, maybe not cancel the projects. Maybe, maybe this is a great time for everybody to use like Zoom for their projects, right? For the students to do it. And we'll learn, the students will learn something about collaborating with each other at a distance. And so I, I, I you know, I, there's all these sort of short-term worries, but there's uh, for me, I look at this as just another 
thing that makes me kind of optimistic about, boy, there's so much to learn here as a teacher and a technologist that uh, away we go. The, then the one thing that I miss the most is, the, is I can't go to an airport and go to England and sit in a bar with somebody and ask them what's really going on, right? I mean, that, that's the part. Oops, and I've, I've lost my uh, video, so I'll stop talking. But we can still hear you. We do have one question here. Let me ask Rob you this. Uh, about uh, are the existing systems that most schools already have capable of scaling to cover university-wide demand on short notice? Is that is that something you could address there, uh, Rob? We're, you know, honestly, we're these systems are so complicated, it's hard to know what's exactly where. And part of the educational effort we're doing right now is to help people kind of draw apart what all the parts are that go into a video conference or a learning management system and what's in the cloud. Um, versus what's on campus, um, et cetera. Uh, I, I think we should expect there are going to be some bottlenecks in the next couple of weeks. Um, and you know, the first time you know we we go to millions of students online starting on the hour next week or the week after, um, we're going to see some hiccups. Um, I I think that's inevitable because you are talking not about a you know a doubling, but you're talking about a you know exponential growth of users um, on these systems, and so that will take a little bit of time. Um, I think you know it's fair to say that there's going to be some scaling problems, but I think it's also true that the nature of this you know virtualized cloud environment that a lot of these applications have now moved to is such that um, <laughs> the same applications that are running in homes, uh, let's say Netflix on Friday night, are testing out Amazon Web Services backend servers on a regular basis and you know, moving yeah. management systems into the daytime slot may be doable over some period of time. Yeah. Well, thank you. Let's let's uh, make a short pivot. I think that Rob and Charles and Adrian, your, your perspectives will still be uh, equally valuable. Uh, I want to turn to John Bernstein. I'm not sure if you have a chance to hear while you weren't yet on, but we, we are, are framing the issue. This is the first of three uh, webcasts uh, Friday at noon Eastern time on broadband and the coronavirus. And of course, we're focusing today on education, both university, but now K through 12. And it's possible that there's been a bit of a delay in getting to the K through 12 world. But just today, uh, for example, Fairfax County schools were, were canceled. They were already canceled for Monday as a telework preparation day and who knows what's likely to happen on Tuesday. So John, just with that context, tell us a little bit about what you've been observing in your world with regard to uh, online education and how people are scrambling to adapt to the coronavirus. Sure. Thanks, Drew. <clears throat> Great to be here. Um, I guess my first observation is uh, I spent the past 20 minutes experiencing what I think a lot of students are about to experience, which is guess what? The browser you're using doesn't always work with whatever software or streaming service you're using. It took me multiple efforts to actually get on here. Some of it was pilot error, definitely, but some of it was also, hey, uh, Safari does not work with StreamYard. And then you've got to go downstream then to Firefox, uh, to Chrome. And you know what? A lot of kids, particularly my kids on Monday, are going to figure this out. So that's number one. Number two, um, I wish we were having this conversation about a week's time. Uh, my daughter, who is a freshman at Penn State, is going to be sitting down and starting to take classes online on Monday. Uh, my other daughter, who is a junior in high school um, and has actually her two-week spring break is starting, is going to be going online for at least five weeks. So it'll be fascinating to see from their perspectives what works and what doesn't. Um, I think they're both very concerned uh, while this may be a great opportunity to learn some new teaching ways uh, and for teachers to learn, I think that's probably true, and for kids to learn differently, I think a lot of them, a lot of the things my kids are experiencing right now is this mourning for the fact that they're not going to be amongst the friends, that they're not going to have physical contact with them. In fact, we're all going to actually have to worry about what does social distancing really mean. You know, that that to them is that's real life, too, because part of school, obviously, is socialization. So I think it's going to be interesting as we progress in terms of what happens, what works, and what doesn't. I can tell you from a policy perspective, um, this is a fascinating time for me. Uh, I, I've been doing education technology policy since the mid-90s. I started with a small educational software company called Lightspan, which I don't know if anybody remembers, but uh, has been bought many times over and has ultimately disappeared from the market. But I got my, my training on that back in, in the mid-90s. 
And since then, it has been a roller coaster ride, really, for ed tech. In fact, for the past, you know, three years or so, one could argue that ed tech has been something of a backwater in the policy space. There have been very few new initiatives uh, at the federal level. There have certainly been some state monies put into this, but but certainly the federal level has not really focused a lot on this. The uh, Department of Education's Office of Ed Tech continues to exist, but really has no funding to support it and is really unable to do a, a great deal right now. Um, let me, let me uh, if I may, yeah. John, let me just back up, back up a little bit. Rather than go right into the policy, let's just yeah. define what is ed tech, right? What is an education technology tool that's different from Zoom, right? Or StreamYard, the, the, the tool we're using, or Google Hangouts, right? Or what what is the difference between, you know, having a tool that does something besides just permit you know, video conferencing or or streaming. Uh, just talk right. talk in general terms for the average user. So, I mean, I think for the average user, ed tech uh, is it, it is what you make of it, right? Um, certainly, these communication devices are critical because what we're doing here and what my kids are about to do is distance learning. That's essentially learning at a remote site. But there's also an entire cottage industry that is built up around various different ed tech apps various different tools that teachers use to teach, everything from polling apps to uh, quizzes to online textbooks to online exams. Uh, you know, ed tech is really anything that involves sort of the digital realm and in and, and trying to reach educators in different ways. The good thing about ed tech is it also is, it can be at least self-paced for learners, right? That there are certainly opportunities to take an entire course online uh, that's time asynchronous and is at your leisure, um, and that you progress as you master concepts. And I think we're going to see actually that idea take off here, uh, at least get a, a massive test bed possibility here as we go through the next you know couple of weeks and, and possibly months. So ed tech is really just a different way to learn. It, it can help with different users. Yeah. Um, yeah. But just just to highlight that, I think that's a very key point the asynchronous learning opportunities of distance learning is one piece of, of, of distance learning. And, you know, several of my kids have done homeschooling at different times and the, the world of homeschooling is completely different now than it was 15 years ago because technology tools are available. So the asynchronous learning is one aspect and the kind of the video or, or group uh, from a distance is another aspect. I'm sure there's others that, you know, a layperson hasn't thought of, but perhaps you, you've thought of, you can add into that. But one thing I will say is that because schools are essentially trying to take their bricks and mortars classrooms and stick them online with as little disruption as possible, you're going to see maybe some inventiveness, but also you're going to see a lot of just the same old, same old. In fact, even though asynchronous learning does give you the opportunity for kids to, you know, wake up later, take their class later, or maybe take it later at night when they're when they're more awake. Uh, for my daughter at Penn State, they're saying we're expecting you to be in your seat in front of your monitor, going to class at the same time you would have gone to class had school been open. I don't know. Whether they're going to screen involved. the professor. They're going to basically yep. just put a camera in front of the. It is unclear to me whether that stuff is archived, whether they can fast forward or review. Uh, I, I'm not sure they figure that out yet. And I think that's something that's going to be interesting to see as the, uh, you know, the rest of the semester progresses for her, how that works and whether it works for her. And there are different types of classes, right? So some of these are lecture-based classes that are completely made for the kind of thing we're doing here. Um, some of them, however, are smaller group discussion classes, like she has to take a theater class this year. How is that going to work this way? Uh, are we going to mute everybody else while somebody performs a scene? Can you perform a scene without a partner uh, unless they're online? I mean, there is a lot of things that they're going to figure out that are going to be totally fascinating. Yeah. And yeah. the same thing goes for, for high school. Right. Well, John, we won't we won't abandon you, but I do want to get Rob and Charles's perspective on on some of the issues you've raised about ed tech and types of classes and so forth on the higher ed, but maybe also um, high school level. And we'll come to some of the policy issues after that. Rob and Charles. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just say I don't know that I have an answer to that. I will say my wife made a suggestion last night that I think is spot on, which is these are days to keep a diary. 
um, because you know a year from now, all the data we're collecting about this will be really useful for all sorts of interesting reasons. And so, um, you know, I actually think I might take her up on that suggestion. Well, you can call it the EdTech Journal of a Plague Year. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so John, I'm I'm on the other side, right? I'm that professor uh, right. at the University of Michigan, but uh, but I'm on the other side of that. And I, I spent from 10 to 12, my normal Friday lecture time, mostly asking my students what they thought, how they thought we should do this, right? And one of the questions I asked, which is exactly what you bring up, is should I move all my office hours to the evening or should I just do them during the day like always? Because these are full-time students. And so working students like stuff in the evening, right? Because they already have jobs and they want stuff in the evening. And so far, and I haven't polled everybody, but so far they're like, keep teaching during the day. That was what they told me, you know, keep the same schedule because we're full-time students and you're one to three o'clock office hours on Monday. I know when those are and you're 10 to noon on Friday lectures and the discussion sections on Thursday. And, and so that I, I have to say we're 24 hours in and I'm like, I wouldn't have thought of that right away, but it makes a lot of sense. And so it really says that we have to be open. Right. And I hope that that John, your daughter's professors, they're, first goal is to establish a culture rather than just keep the information flowing because uh, that really misses the point here of of what's the right way to do this and what's the best way for people to learn and uh, so that and so I'm 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 interested in all these questions and I think the idea of a diary although I'm going to guess for those of us inside it are going to be burned it's going to be burned into our minds pretty intensely as the next couple of weeks uh, uh, unfold right. I, I want to take take some time and, and get to uh, specifically K through 12 and uh, start with you, John. What what are people on the ground saying? What are they uh, adapting to? You described in you know our conversation a little bit of some of the scramble in in Washington policymaking circles. Well, g give us a little flavor of, of what's going on there, and maybe we could hear from everyone on the panel about like what's your last week been like, right? What have you done over the last week that that is germane to this broadband and education and the coronavirus? So uh, this week has proven to be fascinating because there are multiple packages. Um, that are circulating in terms of coronavirus responses on the Hill. And um, none of them actually really address the issue of, well, how do we support kids better at home? I mean, right now they're worried about health and safety, right? Particularly um, kids who uh, may not be able to eat. How are we going to make sure they're able still to get, uh, you know, their free meals, um, particularly around making sure that um, uh, that they have places to go if there's nowhere for them to go. Um, this stuff's all getting worked out on the fly. For school districts, um, I know in Fairfax County, where, where Drew is as well, um, they're taking the day on Monday to figure out how they're going to do this. But I think as all of you guys will probably agree, one day to figure out how to do distance learning for the next, you know, I don't know, possibly the rest of the semester, is probably not gonna be enough time. So there's gonna be a lot of hiccups in the system. Uh, I don't think the federal government can help support that, but we'll see. For me, the, the biggest issue that I've been focused on, and I have been talking to Congress, I've been talking to the Department of Ed, I have been talking to the FCC to some extent, um, trying to figure out what about those kids who are unconnected, right? You know, a lot of folks can go home for their jobs, uh, like all of us here, and sit down at their computers and do a video conference or do phone calls and have access to their emails. And, and life can largely proceed as normal, except you're not seeing people in person. But there are, you know, upwards of, I've seen numbers of 12 million kids who go home without broadband access. Um, what are we going to do about them? And, you know, there are some school districts that have thought this through. I visited uh, Lee High School out in, um, in Fairfax County last year with FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel, and they showed us their hotspot program where they're handing them out to the kids who need them so they're able to connect uh, at home uh, with their devices. And, it, and actually, a lot of these kids... Uh, who are migrants have learned English as a result of that. But now they're gonna have to do their day-to-day -day work and they're gonna need a connectivity. The problem is we don't really have a federal program in place that can turn on a dime for the most part and, and provide that. We are too far down the road uh, in this legislative cycle to actually move a piece of legislation. And there has been a bill introduced on the Senate side and one that's coming on the House side that would essentially set up, set up what's called a homework gap trust fund 
And the homework app is Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel's term uh, for what happens when kids go home and they don't have internet access. They are unable to do their homework like their wealthier peers. So this homework app trust fund would take somewhere between two and $4 billion of auction proceeds from spectrum sales and devote them uh, hopefully to this, which is providing dollars for school districts to equip these kids to go home and do their homework, whether it's hotspots, whether it's providing them laptops, whether you know it's providing them technical support, possibly training for teachers, all that stuff's valuable. Problem is that stuff's not law right now. And Fairfax County just closed. It's the 11th largest district in the country. And I don't know, what are there, 180,000 kids here or something like that? They don't have any, they don't have time or the luxury to wait for legislation. So the one thing that is being looked at hard is what can we do with the existing E-rate program? And for yeah. those of you who don't know what the E-rate is, it is a $4 billion a year program um, that provides discounted uh, internet access costs for, and, and, and you know exterior broadband to some extent, plus Wi-Fi in schools and libraries uh, that schools and libraries apply and get discounts to the FCC. It's a great program, but it is focused solely on connecting schools and libraries to their demarcation points, not to going home. In fact, it is right now, it is forbidden from actually spending money on wireless access that's off campus. That is something you have to cost allocate out if you provide a laptop and the service to a student. So one thing that is being looked at, as I understand it, uh, at the highest echelons of the FCC, uh, we've actually sent letters up on this from the education community. Uh, we're looking for them to waive those rules and to allow school districts to actually do that now, not have to cost allocate. And that way it actually saves an immense amount of money for uh, the schools themselves that they can apply in other places during the shutdown. Um, how that would work in practice, I'm not clear, because back when we ran a test of this, we were talking about, you know, cell phones to some extent. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how this works and we'll see if they do it. But that's the most immediate response that Washington can give. I can tell you that other packages that I've looked at don't think about this issue of what do you do to keep learning going. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, and this is this is what I want to be clear on, I feel like this is really EdTech's moment to shine. This is the moment that everyone has been waiting for to prove that online learning is not just an adjunct, is not just something that people can disregard, not spend a lot of time on, but this is a real viable option. And if EdTech, with all the glitches we're gonna see, right? With all the problems we're gonna have, getting on the right browser with capacity, if EdTech can help all of our kids, because I think it's gonna be all of our, our K through 12 kids ultimately in this country that are gonna go home. If EdTech can help them get online, continue their learning, not you know help us not miss a beat it will have really shown what it can do and it will it will show that to the country the world to parents who have raised concerns with this um which are valid to some extent but it will have shown that this is a real important tool and we need to invest in it thank, thank you. you no that's, that's great, great. You, 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 i hate to get on a soapbox on that but i really think this is the moment no, it, it is. It is good to, to get on that soapbox sometimes. And you see, I put a question up there about uh, uh, providing lectures versus home education methodology. Uh, d does anyone want to take that, uh, uh, Rob or Charles or, or Adrian, as you as you talk a little bit more about you know what this last week has been like and and how uh, home education can can change things or help. I, I may not understand the, the terminology there, and so I might pass a little bit on that. But back to your question about what this week has been like in, in K-12. Um, you know, I, I think that, again, there's this, this is a heroic effort. People want to help here. They're, they're, of course, dealing with their own family situations and their own finding space in their house um, to set up their office and those kinds of things. But um, it, it's, it, you know, there's been a lot of effort this week. K-12 may be a little bit different in that, um, for security reasons and um, filtering reasons and other things, you know, more of their infrastructure may still be in the district or in the BOCES or the uh, ACES or whatever. Is, you know, they're, is that they're, good or bad, Rob? Is that well, going to be harder you know, So you take uh, Google um, for education, that's a cloud-based application. That's going to move fine to the home because kids have been doing it. It's already yeah. tested at scale. Um, but you know, some of the other learning management systems and some of the other things I think are going to be a little bit um, 
you know, even even more um, interesting to observe how that evolves as compared to the higher ed, where they tend to have really big pipes for their research data and probably can, you know, swing the traffic from coming in to going out pretty quickly. I think, um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna see in K twelve um, real disparity. I think we're gonna see some districts that are in great shape. They've already moved to the cloud, and others that haven't. And um, you know, again, I think it is a moment for all of us to shine in our various roles supporting this. I totally agree with that. We got to have some patience. It's just and thirty seconds, Rob, on K on Internet Two's role with K twelve as opposed to higher ed. What what does Internet do do for K twelve schools? Yeah, so uh, almost twenty years ago now, as they were building this very high speed interconnect for research data between the universities, um, you know, some of the schools of education around the country said, "Hey, we do a lot of collaboration. We place a lot of student teachers out in school districts. Can we bring these things together?" and um, gain from some of the the benefits of these abundant networks that have been built for research for K-12. And so um, there are 100,000 or more K-12 institutions that we support across the country, again, through these 43 state and regional networks. And those guys are really where the rubber meets the road with specialized programs that adapt to state conditions on K-12 and libraries. And you know, they do a fabulous job uh, doing mission-specific support for those um, K-12 institutions, and I know there's been a, tons of conversations this week with, you know, again, part of this education, how the networks actually work and helping the policymakers and decision makers understand the difference between a local resource and a cloud resource and a network yeah. versus whatever, but um, a Herculean effort to do education and kind of retune assumptions about what's possible to support some of the, um, the learning opportunities that are going to exist in the next few weeks. Charles, what's been your week like, and and what what do, do you sense the issues and problems are going to be in the, the coming weeks? Well, my daughter teaches uh, K uh, three through five special education, so I have been in hourly contact with uh, what's going on on the ground. Um, I'm glad to say that uh, school got canceled, but there was a a bit of a feeling that oh, kids are not affected, so why do we even need to cancel school? And I'm like, what are you thinking? So. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they're taking steps. I, I think the biggest worry that I have in, in K-12 is I feel like the educational technology that K-12 has is uh, woefully inadequate. Um, and, and, and frankly, I, I, like Google Classroom is the worst learning management system I've ever seen, right? There's everything is better than Google Classroom. And yet the only thing K-12 have has is Google Classroom or something worse. And for Three years now, I've been begging every K-12 teacher I could talk to. I have ways using learning tools, interoperability, and other kinds of cool technologies to make Google Classroom better. Do you have an hour to talk to me about how I could make your Google Classroom better? And they're like, no, I don't have an hour to talk to you. And, and, and so we in higher ed have been adopting ed tech, but K-12 is so overworked. I mean, it's not they're bad people. They're just so overworked that they, they haven't done any of the kind of let's use technology better just before we needed to use it. And now they're going to need to use it. And the Michigan Virtual University just started a Facebook to try to help people in high schools to come up with better strategies. And I joined the Facebook, but I'm afraid to talk because I'm afraid that if I say, hey, if you're using Google Classroom, here's this cool thing that lets you do quizzes in Google Classroom. They're, they're like, okay, now my head just exploded. I'm just trying to deal with like getting school lunches to work. You know, and right. so... And so, so for K-12, I, I, I think ed tech is not going to shine. I think that it doesn't have much chance to begin to shine. I think that it's like this time next year before ed tech will even recover enough to try to think about using their technology better. Um, and and I, don't, I say that sort of in a, a cynical way, but, but knowing how my daughter approaches teaching, it's more about taking care of the children than it is about slamming knowledge into, into people's heads. And so I think it is right for K-12 to think about the, the social, the, the food issues, the school lunch issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that I, it, it's K-12 sort of has this feeling that they can't cancel. And, um, and so I'm glad that they're, they're moving beyond that. And I think that their first, three to five months will just be on logistics and not so much on teaching. And I wish that that were not true, but I don't think they're gonna have enough energy to really improve their teaching. Okay. So, so okay. Can, I, can I respond to that quickly? Oh, yeah. sure, yeah, go ahead, John. So Charles, I, I hear that. I hope you're wrong. <laughs> um, actually, I hope they do take this time to figure out how to improve teaching, how to improve 
uh, whatever delivery platform they're they're using to make this an interesting and and perhaps even in some cases a better experience than some of the classroom stuff they do. I, I fervently hope that happens. I think it's going to be on all of us to highlight the places that is happening. Yes. Uh, to to make sure that everyone understands the best uses of this. You know, one of my clients is the International Society for Technology and Education (ISTE). You know, they have a gigantic conference in June. Uh, and every year they have hundreds upon hundreds of, uh, of sessions devoted to improving your teaching with X product or uh, in X academic area. Um, I'm hoping that that stuff is stuff that they're going to take with them now and use. And, and the reason that we need to do that is because we may not be done this semester with this virus. There is every chance in the world that even once you break the chain, that you're going to see this come back. I've been watching the experts on this and they say, yeah, you can cut down the spread um, and there, you'll see a decrease in infection rate, but we could be facing the same thing again in the fall. So we need to start figuring out how to get this right because what we're seeing next week might quickly become the new normal, possibly for the next semester as well. Well, that, that is that is a great segue. We've gotten another question here about early childhood education, and 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 I want to be strict about our our end at at one, and I want to give Adrienne a chance to to, to talk uh, about some of her experiences this past week. But just quickly, if if anyone of you has any interactions or reactions to this point about child early childhood education, what what do we do? Do we just kind of like okay, well, just you know. Homeschool. I mean, I, which is fine, right? I mean, that may be the right answer, but are there are there tools that online education gives that addresses some of these social interaction aspects? Reactions. I, I don't have any professional reaction. Just a personal one. Um, you know, I think some of the guidelines around what social distancing really means are going to matter here. Um, and, you know, understanding whether getting kids together and letting them um, associate with one another or not uh, is going to be probably one of the key things we need to figure out in terms of, you know, can you put a group of six kids together with a teacher or um, something or not uh, in the preschool environment? Yeah. So, Adrian, tell us about some of your experiences this past week as you've been reporting this. Okay. Um, I'll have to jump off in a few minutes, but as I was reporting um, last night, my article actually ran shorter than I expected it to because I'm here in D.C. living uh, through my university and I'm living in their housing in the city. And then uh, while I was reporting last night around 7 p.m., I got an email saying that we had to evacuate the building in the next few days. Um, and that everyone would have to either uh, terminate the internships that they were doing or have to work remotely. Um, and then we had a meeting together. And so now I'm living the reality of taking a few courses that I, I was taking here. Um, I will have to take them online. And we have a weekly seminar on Fridays uh, where government officials, different people in the community come and speak to us. And so now that will be online next week. Um, but something I've noticed is um, I still haven't been able to um, really crack into reporting on K through 12. Um, but going to that, back to that question that we had earlier about home education, I think aside from the assumption that um, students do have access to broadband, I think there's also an assumption that there will be an actively participating adult in the house um, who is uh, helping the children, at least the very little kids who might not know how um, to use the online device or how to get the class started. Um, I, I think there's this assumption that kids will have access to an adult who can help them. Um, and so that's something that I want to look into in the next few days, um, kind of find out what those assumptions are. I do think that online school can be effective, um, but I think I'm hoping that everyone will have a, a positive experience um, taking these courses that, that weren't designed to be online. Um, through an online platform, um, but it has been very crazy and the university uh, told us that they will accommodate some of the um, assignments that were supposed to be done in person or in a specific way that they'll have to come up with alternative assignments. Um, and speaking with Washington University, they also will have a notation on, 
on students' grades, saying that these classes were completed under unusual yeah. circumstances. Um, so well, it should be interesting. I think a it, lot will there will be a lot to report on it's next interesting week. Interesting times. Unfortunately, we we just have one minute, so I'm going to go ahead and and uh, say thank you to all of you who have watched our webcast here. We will continue this next week at this time, 12 noon Eastern time, and it will be on telework and how broadband and telework is going to contribute to combating the coronavirus. Thank you all for joining us and visit us at broadbandbreakfast.